Okay, Andy, we are going to need to file a couple of extensions for our Form 990, and we have grant RFPs we're responding to that are asking for our most current form. We expect we'll have our 2019 990 by the end of the year, if not a bit sooner. What do we do in the meantime? Is there anything else we can or should do to ensure this doesn't make our organization look bad to the funder? Um, no, I think in this situation, I think funders are probably going to be okay with that. I mean, you're, most organizations file extensions before their 990 anyway. They just sort of do it as a matter of course so that they can make sure that they don't accidentally miss the deadline and get in trouble. If it's asking for your most recent 990, send them the most recently filed 990. Um, if it takes you a super long time to get to it this time, um, I, I think you're going to be okay. I, you know, look, I look at 990 sometimes and, and I do have questions like in just normal years, if somebody takes a really long time to get it filed, you know, it makes me, makes me wonder like, so what are you actually doing? It's not that hard. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's not like an absurd amount of work. Plus it happens every year. So you should probably be prepared for it. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, just follow the instructions. <laughs> the most recent 990 is the one you just filed. So, well, so, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you something. So you talk about, gosh, it might raise questions if it's a really long time, like period of time until they get it filed in, in normal, normal years that don't have a pandemic with them. So I'm curious to know what that, like, do you have a recommendation about what becomes too long? Like what is a normal amount of time? So if I'm, if I'm looking up nine nineties for whatever reason, and it's like, so now it's, we're in the middle of 2020 roughly. Right. So I, I would expect to see a 2018 or a 2019, uh, 990. Those would be the, the two that I would expect. If I saw 2017, I would say, why are we still looking at a 2017 990? I mean, there, there should be a 2018 by now. Um, so that, that would right. be my question. Like, right. You know, if, it's either going to be this year or last year. If it's two years ago, then it's probably too long. And so maybe, Andy, like maybe that's also, I mean, I, I think that totally is it answers the question. But I guess I'm also thinking if, because we don't know, I mean, exactly. It sounds like it's just the 2019 they're behind on. But I, I know there's a lot of organizations that get really behind sometimes on the 990s. And um, I would say if, if it is something like a 2017 where it feels like it's excessively long, like we're a couple years past due um, or a few years past due. I mean, if there's room on the grant proposal, maybe there's an maybe you can put a quick paragraph or a few sentences just trying if those aren't going to incriminate you further. Right. But if you have <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's your caveat. And if you don't have to lie about it. But my point is, is like if you can if there's a good explanation for it. Perhaps just even making notes saying we expect any day to have our whatever 20, whatever year it is, you know, 990 here. And as soon as we get it, we'll update our files. Like something as a funder would make me feel better that they at least acknowledged it versus like that's business as usual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is they come around every year, too. So even if you file a bunch of extensions, I mean, even it's like this is even with our personal taxes, right? Yeah. It, they they move the extension out to July, but that doesn't mean next year it's in July right. too. Like you still have to do it again starting in January. So all you're doing is like you're compressing the pain. It is. Just um, get it over so, with. Rip the band-aid. Yeah, just get it over. Rip the band-aid off. Get it over with. And 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 that, you know, the, what's the legitimate reason for having a 2017 990 at this point? It's like um the building burned down <laughs> and a lot of our files were in it. I'm trying to think of why yeah. you would Could be there be two any years reason? Old. Yeah. I mean, they would have to, I mean, it, you know, maybe so our, um, the, the CFO was actually indicted for fraud, um, and stole a bunch of money from us. And it's taking us a longer time to untangle what they did. I mean, I think there could be legitimate reasons, um, that, that you might have an old 990, um, but not, not a whole lot of them and not any of them that you really want. Yeah. And probably not things you want to put in writing either. I mean, that would be a little embarrassing to even talk about the fraud, right? right? Yeah. That's probably not going to help your case. <laughs> it happens, but yeah, I, I don't, you wouldn't want to talk about it. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. 
Hey, podcasters. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Nonprofit Everything. I've got Andy Shirk, my amazing co-host with me, and a huge thank you to Anne, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits, for making these podcasts possible. And you as our listeners, you're a bright spot in this crazy world of ours, and hats off to you for setting time aside to to join us right now. Uh, We appreciate you being here. And the good news is this is not a Zoom call. So you don't have to be all cleaned up. You can be in your old scrubs or your sweats. You can stop and start us or pause us and still pick us back up when you're ready. So, hey, it's like a double (laughs) bonus, right? But anyways, thanks for joining us. Enjoy this episode. This episode of Nonprofit Everything is sponsored by the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits Job Board, your one-stop shop for the next step in your career. Searching job listings is totally free, and AN members receive a big discount in posting new jobs. There are dozens of nonprofit jobs available right here in Nevada, and there are out-of-state jobs too. Find it by going to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage and clicking the Job Board button, or access it directly at jobs.alliancefornevadanonprofits.com, or find the link in the Nonprofit Everything show notes. We weren't selected for a corporate grant that we applied for, and we asked one of our board members who knows someone to find out why. In addition to the typical budgets are shrinking, we get lots of requests kind of stuff. She also said that we didn't demonstrate sufficient ROI. I know what return on investment means, and we're very clear on our impact, but how are we supposed to figure that out for a particular company? Oh, a juicy one. I like juicy ones. So here, so here's the thing. It's interesting that they would they would assume that that it's your job as a nonprofit to figure out what their return on investment is supposed to be for some sort of charitable gift. Isn't that an interesting position to be in? Well, it is. But see, that's where I'm. See, this is where I'm sort of pushing. I have more questions about this because I'm not sure if that's what the funder said. So, right. This is kind of like the game of telephone. We all know the game of telephone is dangerous, right? (laughs) Yeah. So, so you have your board member who's got this connection at the corporation. They come back and say, well, you know, budget's shrinking. We get lots of requests and you didn't demonstrate sufficient ROI. So I didn't read, like if I heard that, I would not think they were saying that in relation to my company, I would think they were saying my organization is not showing how we, my nonprofit is not showing how we demonstrate ROI. Yeah. So it's interesting. I guess it's the question is like, what exactly was meant by this? Because clearly the person who wrote us about this has an interpretation of it that the company wants something re- specific to the company's ROI. Yeah. So, okay. So well, let's answer both questions. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> well, you go. <laughs> so the, I mean, you're, I think you're the, the, the bigger point is that companies will say things <laughs> that, that may not mean what they think they mean just because yeah. they're just not giving you money because they, they, they just aren't like your, right. your, res, your resume did not get to the top of the pile fast enough and they ran out of cash or whatever the real yeah. reason is. Right. I mean, gosh, yeah. right now, I'm like, I don't know that, I don't know that corporate grants is a good way to get any money. So no, I think people should probably run f- for the hills. <laughs> yeah, from those. I don't know. I think that's a, that's a fool's errand right now, but okay. So, so if, if it is interpretation number one, which is the company is expecting you to understand what's in it for them to be a good corporate citizen. Um, that's something that I think you can unpeel over a long period of time with lots and lots of conversations with executives from that company to figure out, you know, why, why are you engaged in this thing that you're calling community relations? Like, what is the purpose? What is the corporate purpose behind doing this? Is it because you want your employees to think that you, they work someplace that's a nice place to the community? Are they trying to... Um, are they trying to right some wrong? Is the the CEO's spouse super into some particular cause? Like they're they're unless you do a lot of digging, you're never going to know what the real reasons that they're engaging in these things are. And and to be honest, the bigger the company, the more political and weird the reasons are. Of um, course, you know you can get companies will give money to people who are like terrible nonprofits and are doing a rotten job just because they happen to be a squeaky wheel someplace else in that company's business. 
So, so I think, you know, that unless you really have a good understanding of what that company wants, I think you're going to have a really hard time trying to pin them down on what that specific reason is. Um, especially if they're, if they're doing sort of general grant applications that aren't in a particular sector. So if, if they just, you know, you see them all the time, like we want to, we want to do something good for the community. So send us right. your best idea and we'll so apply. Yeah. yeah just and a, we don't care if you're arts or if you're seniors or if you're homeless youth, yeah. because we're, we're going to just fund all of them and consider all of them. Yeah, We're going to look at all of them and we're going to decide which one we like the best. And, and to be honest, then that tells me that, that what they really want to do is they want to engage some internal team in the process of looking through applications, <laughs> that that's yes. the that's the end game for them. They don't care what the impact is. They they want their employees to have a good time giving away money. Um, Absolutely. So, so I don't know that you know if if that's the answer. I don't know that there's a whole lot you can take away from it other than maybe that funder is just not super sophisticated. Well, I think that, but I also would add what what I would push for either either scenario here. What I would push for is you have a board member that you went to to ask to try to get you in and they got you intel. So they have a good enough relationship with somebody at that company. I would see if you can have that board member make an introduction for you. So you can just kind of bypass that middleman where messages get confused or mixed up. And then you can start building your own relationship with this corporation. So you truly can ask some of these questions or at least ask other kinds of questions that help give you that answer right because i think this I, I love the fact that this board member we all want board members who actually will connect or you know do this kind of work for us but it's also like sometimes it creates an added layer or barrier that i think makes it more complicated or confused so see if that board member will just take it a next step and say hey board member like i appreciate you doing that and i've got follow-up questions rather than keep you there can is there any way you'd be willing to make an introduction i just want to build a relationship and see what happens right yeah yeah that's a great idea maybe you know six months from now or whatever you can go have coffee right right <laughs> right whenever we're allowed to escape our homes again and so so what about if it's the other scenario what if it's a the company is like actually knows what they're doing and they um they're they're concerned that your proposal doesn't demonstrate that it does enough good for the money that you're asking for. I think that is great insight and intel if, if it's that, right? Because if that company's feeling that way, there's probably going to be others that feel that way. Uh, Andy, you and I both see it all the time, right? Today's donors, many of them are driven toward metrics. They want to know it is definitely the ROI. I like I like more of the soft version of social ROI, right? Because then you're talking about the numbers and the social impact. And so if, if that is the case, then I think what you're hearing is that perhaps you don't have enough measurement in place to really be able to share the numbers and perhaps the narrative behind what, what money you're saving companies, the community by solving this social issue, right? So, you know, you say, take, for example, let's make this concrete. There's whatever, 100 homeless people that you want to help serve. Um, without serving them, it costs the community, whatever, 7 million bucks in public and social welfare assistance. But if you if your organization stepped in and tried to get them self-sufficient and a roof over their head, it's only going to cost 2.4 million. Like if you can get to that point where you know that's what the funder's looking for, then perhaps there's ways you can start building in some metrics in your organization so that you deliver that more for all proposals. And I think it's going to make the organization more competitive, like your nonprofit more competitive if you do that. So I think that's a positive learning if that's the case, because perhaps maybe you got a little soft in that area or you just haven't had the time or money because I know it takes right. It takes time to measure impact like that and to measure that. And I I want to be sensitive to, to that because not everyone can do that. But but perhaps it helps you start to create a plan for how you can do that in the future. Yeah. And de depending on what the cause is, the numbers get fuzzy really fast, too. Yeah, true. You know, so, I mean, if you're talking, if you're an arts organization um, and you talk about what the impact of the arts is, I mean, there, there's really concrete numbers, but there's some cynical donors out there that'll look at that and say, I don't believe any of this. Yeah. Right. And, and in which case, it doesn't matter how much time and energy and money you spend on trying to actually figure out what the number is. Like, you're never going to convince somebody that you can get from point A to point B. Mm hmm. I 
have an employee who is refusing to come back to the office. I'm assuming it's because he still doesn't feel safe given the pandemic. I'm not sure how to handle this. I've asked for each staffer to be in the office at least one day a week for the rest of the month. Our office is perfectly suited to work in. Please advise on what I should do. Well, I always start with these things saying I'm not an HR expert. So uh, there's my (laughs) disclosure, right? My safety net. But I mean, there's two, there's two big questions I think that, that need to be explored. One, um, why are you asking each staff to be in the office at least one day a week? Like, is there a purpose? Is there, is there a reason they need to be there? Like, do they see clients? Is there something that they can't do at home that they can do at the office? So I would really implore the person who asked this to really reflect, I mean, and, and try to get out of, you know, the, the, comfort zone and think about if you have to actually be in an office because it just it I think in general I don't know I don't know the mission so it's very tough but in general I think most things we do at an office we can do at home and probably do 10 times faster you would probably disagree Andy you've got kids so but like I haven't done it anyone with kids is probably cursing me right now but I'm just thinking like in general like I work so much better from home because I'm uninterrupted right I have more focused time I have all the technology tools I need here probably what I don't have is like a copy machine or whatever whatever I don't know like I guess I'm just like really trying to I'm puzzled because I don't know more about the organization to understand why why this the executive director is feeling like this this push to have everyone there maybe maybe to see if that they're truly doing work right I mean I don't know yeah I think there's a concern about that right now yeah I feel like there's there's so much like there's so many conversations right now about what what the resistance, the historical resistance has been to people working from home. Um, I mean, obviously it's something that's very, very topical. And I've seen probably 30, maybe not 30, maybe a dozen articles um, in, in pretty reasonable journals that talk about that specific activity. I'm like, so what do you get? What do you get from being in the office? What you get is that interaction with other people. And if you're really asking somebody to come into the office one day a week and they're there with nobody else because you're trying to do it that way, I don't see what the purpose of that is other than you, you maybe, you know, like just kind of like you said, maybe you just don't think they're actually doing anything when they're at home and you feel like if they're in the office, maybe then you can keep an eye on them. Or if it's like me and you're just tired of hearing screaming kids in the background. <laughs> Um, escape, every time you want to have a conversation with them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think for kind of for where we feels like for where we are right now, um, being more, more lenient with folks and giving them the benefit of the doubt and having open conversations about like, like, tell me why you don't want to come in. I'll tell you why I think it's important for you to come in. You tell me why you don't want to come in. Cause it sounds like you think, you know, you're guessing that the reason they don't want to come in is because they don't feel safe, but let's, let's find out for sure because it could be something completely different, right? It could be that you're paying them peanuts and they don't want to put gas in their car and drive all the way across town because their spouse lost their job and they've got three kids and they're trying to figure out whether or not they're going to get the heck out of town or not. Exactly. Um, so, so have that conversation with people. This is a really good time to, to make really good friends with your employees and make sure that they're doing okay and, and not play, you know, big kahuna. I'm going to tell you what to do next. I would, I would really err on the side. I, I think the best leaders right now are erring on the side of caution and compassion and to some degree accommodation, right. From typical work styles and behaviors, because at the end of the day, um, we also don't know if this person, this staffer, I mean, it, there's there's so many variables, could be a vulnerable population. We don't know any of that. And so I think you really start to get into a sticky situation um, trying to force something like that. Uh, it, but again, that probably requires an HR specialist, not not Stacy Wedding saying something about that. But but in general, I, I agree with you, Andy. And it's like, I, I feel like the co- there could be a really healthy conversation here and it might open your eyes up to what this employee, like what struggles or challenges they're having. And perhaps you can help them in another way, like solve some of those. So, um, you know, it could be like, oh, they don't have childcare or they don't know how they're going to whatever. There's just so many variables. So perhaps um, it's an opportunity to kind of build, I don't know, build trust and build a relationship there. 
Yeah. I mean, right right now there's a hundred percent chance they don't have childcare. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the, like coming up with like figuring it out, like figuring out what the actual root cause is. And, and remember the, I mean, unemployment is through the roof right now. Yeah. And, and things are going to get, things are going to get much uglier before they get, before they get okay again. And nonprofits are going to get hit really hard. And we want to make sure that we're, we're keeping employees, good employees, uh, making sure that we're retaining those good employees because they're all going to be in really uncomfortable positions anyway. Like people don't it, like lots and lots of jobs have just straight up dried up. And um, especially here in Las Vegas, for example, um, it's going to take us until you know 2024 is the last thing that I saw until things get back to normal again. And that's even if a whole bunch of dominoes fall in the exact right way. So they're, it's very likely that a whole lot of people are going to be leaving town. They're going to be leaving the state. They're going to be going someplace where um, it's not necessarily completely reliant on a tourist economy. So, so, so take that in, into consideration because your workforce, your, your available pool of people that can work for you may be very small in the future. And I also think lastly, you probably, uh, how you handle this situation sends a message to the rest of your staff as well. I don't know how big a staff you have, but People are really looking for strong, sound leadership right now, and people are looking for some sort of safety and um, sense that you know they're they're safe and they're being taken care of. And so, uh, I, I think you run the risk of just not only a ripple effect negatively with this employee if you don't handle it the right way, but with others around. And that's probably the last thing you want right now. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you joining Stacy and I in our, our blanket forts in two different houses on two different sides of town um, while we geeked out on nonprofit stuff. And we only do this because you guys send us amazing questions. So please keep sending us the amazing questions. We love answering them. We love hearing from you. Um, if you've got comments, um, you can send us poetry. If you've got poetry, we can read your poetry Ooh. online or on, on the podcast. Um, Pretty much anything you want to do, we'll just just get in touch with us, yeah. and we'll we'll go Tell ahead us and a take joke. care of that on the podcast. Sometimes we for need you. jokes too, so you know, like, hey, yeah. well, at this point, any comic relief, anything that can just brighten brighten our days and everyone else's days listening, please send it to us. Nonprofiteverything dot com. You can submit a question or go to you know any of our you know tag Andy and I anywhere you can find us, Facebook, email, whatever. You can you can send us your questions. We'd love to to be able to mix it up a little bit with what's on your minds. Yeah. I, f I feel like I probably shouldn't say this cause it's just asking for trouble, but um, you may have noticed that sometimes we get questions that, um, that Stacy and I aren't, we disagree with the point of view of the person asking the question <laughs> strongly <laughs> <Yes>. sometimes. <laughs> and um, just because we're, we're nice people, we do our best to stay respectful as we're answering the question. So, so if, if you're bored, maybe send us a question and see if it's possible to get one of us to lose our minds. Because oh, <laughs> we usually well, try to be super polite and, and see if you can figure out a way to ask us a question that we want. I mean, if it's if it's super absurd, we won't read it at all. But, but see if you can squeeze one in there where if you can see if you can make Stacy lose her mind and be mean. Well, and I, I occasionally, I'll tell you, I had a couple of questions tonight. I was bordering on it. I got the look from Andy, you guys. So, it, you know, we're, we're on our Zoom so we can see each other when we do this. And I, I got the look. So uh, I told him to edit me out because I kind of turned into a beast. But uh, anyways, it's also in, in my defense, it's 1030 on a Monday. So oh, I'm ready for it to be Friday already and ready for the day to be over. <laughs>